Welcome to the first presentation in the new year of Children of Jewish, Hol Jewish Holocaust Survivors Speaker Series. We are quite, quite proud to have Professor Larry Schweikert here with us to kick it off. More about Professor Schweikert in a moment. First, let me indulge in some shameless plugs. CJHS is looking forward to another year filled with exciting and thought-provoking events. Upcoming subjects will include discussions of Iran, a clear-eyed look at our country's K-12 educational system, and Israel in the crosshairs. Your own book of the Ayn Rand Institute will be here to discuss the connection between the worsening economy and the rise of anti-Semitism. We are also welcoming back our distinguished uh, CJHS Quartet, retired Commander Jennifer Dyer, Rick Richman, Avi Bell, and Omri Sarin. We have more authors events coming up, including Diana West on her newest book, American Betrayal, The Secret Assault on Our Nation's Character. You will have another chance to experience what we refer to as our romp through the Bill of Rights with the extraordinary duo of Judge Alex Kaczynski and Professor Eugene Volokh, this time addressing the Second Amendment. We hope you have had the chance to explore our newest addition to the CJHS website, The Activist Digest, an easy to access guide to the most important issues of the day by the brightest minds on these topics. In addition, if you haven't already, please pick up our latest call to action message. It's there on the front table, which outlines our opposition to President Obama's nominations of Secretaries of Defense, State, and the CIA Director. Last, we have a save the date announcement for February 4. Professor Abraham Zion, the Chair of Law and Mass Media at REL University Center, will be speaking at how the Jewish community should, convent, should confront Arab propaganda. Okay, now to the reason we are here. Vladimir Lenin said, give me four years to teach the children and the seeds I have sown will never be uprooted. It's hardly a secret that many of today's colleges are little more than indoctrination centers for the left. The totalitarian model was to establish an outcome-based education system. Children of Jewish Holocaust survivors knows well where this leads and is proud to bring Professor Larry Schweikert to the community tonight. Over the years, Professor Schweikart has written nearly 30 books, dozens of articles and book reviews, and became an authority in antebellum banking and finance. In the 1990s, he wrote his own history of American business, The Entrepreneurial Adventure, then with Michael Allen began work on a larger project, A History of the United States. Published in 2004 as A Patriot's History of the United States, this book became a bestseller and attracted the attention of the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and talk show host Rush Limbaugh, who interviewed the professor for his newsletter in March 2004. Now in multiple editions and a fourth printing, Patriot's History continues to be the alternative history for parents who have had enough of the dominant liberal left textbooks. In 2006, Dr. Schweikart followed up with a controversial America's Victories, Why the U.S. Wins Wars. Featured on book TV and numerous television and radio shows, he was invited by the President of the United States to the, to the Oval Office for an extended discussion of military history in August 2006. With his book, 48 Liberal Lies About American History, that you probably learned in school, Professor Schweikart turned back to the culture wars. He has appeared on The 700 Club, Fox and Friends, Fox News, Book TV, and dozens of national and local radio shows, including Rush Limbaugh, Laura Ingram, Laura Ingram Hugh Hewitt, Dennis Prager, and many others. A novelist who has written a 9-11 thriller, September Day, and a World War II counterfactual military drama, Halsey's Bluff, Professor Schweikart brings history to life in a variety of venues. Tonight, Professor Schweikart will examine the top 20 college history textbooks and show what they teach about everything from the Rosenbergs to the transcontinental railroads to Ronald Reagan. His presentation will include an informative slide presentation. We will be having a Q&A after the event, so hold your questions till then. We will pass a microphone around. 
Professor Schweikart's newly rele released book, A Patriot's History of the Modern World, Volume 1, will be available for purchase and signing. We will also have available for purchase A Patriot's History of the United States and 48 Liberal Lies About American History. Please join me in welcoming Professor Larry Schweikart. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Doris, for having me here. You know, every time I'm in LA, I hope that the first words of my speech will begin, I'd like to thank the Academy. <laughs> Somehow I doubt that's going to happen soon, but you never know. After all, I hear that Oliver Stone made a documentary, so anything's possible. <laughs> Most of you know me from uh, Patriots History of the United States, which I published in uh, 2004 uh, with Michael Allen. Um, there's a little uh, story behind the book. It did okay. You know, when it first came out, uh, Rush interviewed me, and it, it made it up to number 35, I think, on uh, Amazon. And we were happy. I mean, it was doing really well. It was, it's great. You know, we were very happy. And then it just kind of hit a plateau, and then that was it. And, you know, we, we were good with that. It was, it was gaining influence, but it wasn't going nuts. And uh, then in 2010, I was on the Glenn Beck Show, and um, I gave him a copy of uh, Patriot's History, and uh, he said, I know this book. Do I know this book? Now, if you've read Patriot's History, your reaction is, this is a great book. Every book I write isn't a great book, but that's a great book. And so I knew Glenn had not read that book. And, and so he called me five days later at home. He says, hey, this is a Glenn Beck. He says, you know, when you were on the show, uh, I hadn't read your book. I, I know, Glenn. It's OK. He says, no, I read it over the weekend. It's 948 pages, right? I read it over the weekend. This is a great book. <laughs> So he proceeds to hold it up on his show every single night with little yellow postums in it. Like it's like a one hour infomercial. And this is when he had three and a half million viewers, right? And so it goes up and up and up. And I get a call from the publisher. Hey, your, your, your book's uh, up number one on Amazon. I go, yeah, that, that's great. Next week I get a call. Hey, your book's on the extended New York Times list. I go, yeah, that's really cool. Next week, your book's no, number 10 on the New York Times list. Yeah, that's great. And then I get the call. Um, I could hear the champagne corks popping and you know a few other things going on in the background and they go oh your book's number one on the New York Times you go yeah that, that's neat that's really cool no you don't get it it's number one on the New York Times you go yeah no I get it that's great no 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 it's, it's everywhere it's in Target it's in Costco it's in Walmart I said wait a minute it's in Walmart thank you God <laughs> Because I wanted to reach average people. I want to be up there with Joyce Meyer and Rachel Ray and all the important people, you know, who are selling lots of books. So anyway, that's the, uh, that's the background on Patriot's history. Um, currently, uh, I've just completed Patriot's History of the Modern World, Volume 1, and we will have Volume 2 out uh, this um, uh, October. Uh, it, it's, it's a pretty big book. Unfortunately, and I've just got to say this, volume one is a little down. You know, you've got two world wars and a depression. And it's hard to spice it up. <laughs> and, and so, but volume two is going to be a lot lighter and a lot, lot more social history and stuff. Uh, anyway, um, for those of you who don't know my background, <laughs> I'm in the Jaws t-shirt. <laughs> This is when we opened for a Steppenwolf down in Tampa. We even had our, t our, our own little uh, t-shirt, the guy in the yellow t-shirt, our band's name was Rampage, and he has a Rampage t-shirt with our picture on it. I'm not sure if he's wearing the same t-shirt in the picture, which would be one of those mirror things where you go back and back and back and back. Anyway, uh, note the platform shoes there. <laughs> And then that's me with my little drum set and me with Savoy Brown. I'm the only one not stoned in that picture. <laughs> uh, Patriot's History, which is now trademarked, has found a home in over 30 colleges and universities, dozens of high schools, thousands of home schools. It also has some pretty interesting readers, including this guy who's still in the NFL playoffs, quarterback Tom Brady. Of course, it's probably a publicity shot, you know, Patriot, Patriots, but nevertheless, I'll take it, right? 
After the success of Patriot's History, the publisher suggested I take some of the debates that we had in the end notes about various textbooks and use that as the basis for a new book, and that became uh, 48 Liberal Lies About American History that you probably learn in school. And the question that I'm, of course, I ask most often is only 48, and my answer is I wanted to save room for you know, volume two through 50. Um, for 48 Liberal Lies, I looked at the top 20 US history textbooks, and these are college books, not necessarily high school books, and I included books like Howard Zinn's People's History because so many uh, colleges actually use that as a textbook. So when we talk about bias in textbooks, what do we mean? Uh, the obvious form of bias is to take something that's just obviously wrong and, or an error and try to make it appear factually correct. This is the easiest one, of course, to spot, the easiest one to disprove. Um, but a more insidious bias occurs in what I call coverage. What topics are covered versus which topics are not covered. This is why Zinn's book is so bad. And believe it or not, I actually had trouble finding things to include in 48 Liberal Lies from Zinn because he doesn't make specific little lies. He makes these large contextual lies that you have to read the whole thing to kind of get. For example, uh, Zinn covers the entire American Civil War and doesn't mention a battle. How do you cover a war and not mention a battle? I don't get it. Uh, fighting is the essence of war, and you could argue it's the most important part of war. All the social history is bunk, depending on whether or not you win or lose on the battlefield. Uh, ever hear about anti-war protesters in Gaul when Julius Caesar captured them? Of course not. They were executed with the rest who lost the war and sold into slavery. Does anyone really care about social life in Hiroshima 10 seconds before the bomb went off? No, because it's pretty much irrelevant, made so by the effects of war. Often in writing, what you leave out of a book is as important as what you put in. So let's look at some examples of these 20 leading college textbooks. Imagine you're looking through these books and you're, you're, you're just seeing what's out there. You're looking in the 20th century sections, and I want to emphasize 20th century. And you start looking at pictures. You're just going to go through and look at pictures. And you notice the most common picture uh, of the 20th century, let me see, oops, back it up, I lost one, is uh, FDR. He's the most common one. Eh, no problem there, he, you know, he's a very important figure in American politics, no argument. The atomic bomb is the second most common picture in these textbooks. So would it surprise you to know that the third most common image in the textbooks is not John Kennedy, or the moon landing, or Martin Luther King, or Ronald Reagan, the third most common image is the KKK. How about this? You're looking at those same textbooks, and you look at the Kennedy assassination sections. You already know John Wilkes Booth killed Abraham Lincoln, unless it was the vampires. And in virtually all of the textbooks, he's correctly identified as a confederate. So how is Lee Harvey Oswald, the man who shot JFK, identified in the majority of these textbooks? Quote, a Marine. Quote, a reformed Marine. Quote, a former Marine. In only one of the textbooks is he correctly identified as a communist. So this is the kind of stuff that you see in the textbooks about key events and people in our past. Not every textbook, I want to point out, contains all 48 lies. Even Zen misses a few. But most of them contain more than one, and some of them contained most, uh, one third to one half of all the lies. What it suggests is an overwhelming mindset or bias behind the people who write these. As, as I like to say, they don't get together at Jekyll Island and concoct some conspiracy. This, this is how they see America. It's the underlying view they have of the United States. Oppressive, imperialistic, and evil. So here are some of the most prominent liberal lies. <clears throat> Lie number 19 very much in the news just about two years ago, the Rosenbergs were not spies and were wrongfully executed. Gene Boydston's book, Making of America, writes, quote, 
Julius Rosenberg, former member of the Communist Party, and his wife Ethel were convicted in a controversial trial on charges of conspiracy to commit espionage and sentenced to death in April 1951. The controversy over their guilt has continued to the present day. Uh, no, it hasn't. <laughs> There may be controversy, but their guilt is established beyond a doubt, including by their longtime collaborator, Martin Sobel, who late in life admitted that Julius helped pass atomic bomb secrets to the Soviets. But that doesn't stop the historians. Mark C. Carnes, in his book, American Destiny, wrote, although they were no major spies, and the information they revealed was not important, the Rosenbergs were executed. Huh? <laughs> Passing the single biggest secret of the late 1940s to the most deadly weapon in human history to your avowed enemy is not important? You're not a major spy? What would you have to pass along? Nude photos of Princess Kate? Never mind. <laughs> That's been done, sorry. Yet a third textbook, one of the worst, John Mack Farragher's book, Out of Many, said, quote, the government's case against the Rosenbergs rested on the testimony of their supposed accomplices, some of them secretly coached by the FBI. Um, no, <laughs> the evidence that convicted them was the schematic of the atomic bomb that they handed over. I don't know how you coach a schematic. Now, to many of you, the Rosenbergs still may be murky figures, you know, what importance were they to us? Not much except the uniformity with which the books deal with them is just stunning. And by the way, when the USSR fell and the KGB's archives were opened up and the secrets released, there are the Rosenbergs front and center as paid KGB agents. None other than Nikita Khrushchev, and we have to trust him because he's a communist, <laughs> right? None other than Nikita Khrushchev said the Rosenbergs provided, and I quote, very significant help in advancing the Soviet atomic bomb. Okay, how about another one? Lie number 41. The transcontinental railroads never would have been built without government. Thomas Bailey and David Kennedy in The American Pageant, probably the best-selling history book of all time, say, quote, transcontinental railroad building was so costly and risky as to require government subsidies. Another excellent selling book, A National Experience by John Blum, agrees, quote, some form of public credit was essential to build the transcontinentals. These books ignore the only profitable transcontinental, 100% privately financed road built by a one-eyed Canadian entrepreneur named James J. Hill called the Great Northern Railroad. Don't let the picture fool you, that's a glass eye. When all, <laughs> when all the subsidized railroads failed in the 1873 crash, only the Great Northern kept running. Can you say Solyndra? Four years ago, it seems a lifetime, then President <laughs> candidate Barack Obama announced we needed a new cabinet level position for high technology, a czar for high tech. And what did he cite? the transcontinental railroads as the reason we need this. I suggest to you the last thing high tech needs is the government telling it what to build and how to build. Can you imagine Mark Zuckerberg had been monitored or controlled by government? Then there's lie number 45. LBJ's Great Society had a positive impact on the poor. David Harrell's Unto a Good Land notes Quote, great society domestic programs cost only a little more than $6 billion from 1964 to 67 and remain pillars of the welfare state, changing many lives for the better. Of course, most of those programs weren't even up and running by 1967, but by the 1990s, when the results were clearly observable, they had cost nearly a trillion dollars. And who, as to whose lives were made better, it might be noted that they introduced two generations of Americans to unheard of levels of illegitimacy and family breakup. That doesn't stop John Blum from writing, quote, the Great Society was the most impressive record of domestic legislation in a single session for 30 years, representing the culmination of an effort to reverse patterns of privation and inequality. 
except there's a problem. The advances against poverty were occurring before the Great Society. They continued for a while after the Great Society, but when they really kicked in, they hit a plateau and then went back up. Seems like no matter how much more money we spent, nothing happened to change poverty. The way I like to put it is, we were winning the war on poverty before LBJ declared it. Then there's lie 17. Sacco and Vanzetti were innocent. Many of you probably aren't all that tuned into who Sacco, Sacco and Vanzetti were. Nicola Sacco and Bartolomeo Vanzetti in April 1920 robbed a factory paymaster and a security guard in South Braintree, Massachusetts. They killed the guard in the process. They were arrested for that and a second robbery, convicted and given the death penalty for shooting the guard. Critics claimed they were only executed because they were political activists, not because they did the crime. Our friend Mark Carnes and John Garrity write in American Destiny, quote, their trial was a travesty, and the authors link their execution to the excesses of, quote, fundamentalists, the xenophobes, and, of course, the Klan. These historians have the Klan on the brain, I'm telling you. Makes me wonder if some of them aren't like closet grand dragons or something. <laughs> Gene Boydston's Making a Nation says, the state doctored evidence and witnesses changed testimony, but the judge favored the prosecution. Virtually every book I looked at states or implies they were innocent based on the sole fact they said they were innocent. Imagine that, a murderer who said, I was framed. <laughs> now that's Joran Vandersloot. I think he's probably OJ's cellmate by now. <clears throat> Truth is, modern ballistics experts in the 1980s performed new tests on Sacco's gun and co concluded that, in fact, it was the murder weapon. It wasn't tampered with, as historians claim, that he and only he had access to the gun. It matched slugs found at both crimes. Nine witnesses saw Sacco at the scene of the shooting. Four specifically identified Vanzetti. Oh, and Sacco had other cartridges of the same make and caliber as those in the murder weapon in his pocket when he was arrested. 30 years later, one of the witnesses who tried to provide an alibi for Sacco and Vanzetti admitted he lied. That didn't stop Massachusetts Governor Michael Dukakis from proclaiming the duo innocent in 1977. He said, quote, all disgrace should be removed from their names. No, Governor, it just adds more disgrace to your name. And to add a cherry on top of this entry, in 2005, a letter surfaced from socialist author Upton Sinclair, who championed the two, in which Sacco and Vanzetti's own attorney admitted that, in fact, they murdered the guard. What about the American West, the Indians, and the Buffalo? This is the famous crying Indian. Chief Iron Eyes Cody, who was featured in the Keep America Beautiful 1979 public service ad, people start pollution, people can stop it. Along with Earth Day, by the way, I gotta tell you, I, I always tell my students on Earth Day, uh, we always have a big tire burning out at my house, and I, I encourage them to come out and, and bring their favorite dish of a, a, a almost extinct animal, like spotted owl stew or something. We have a great time and bring all the plastic bags they can find. <laughs> Along with Earth Day, first observed on March 21st, 1971, this ad officially touched off the environmental or ecology movement in the United States. In this famous ad, viewers watched an Indian paddle his canoe up a polluted stream as smokestacks belched their black soot into the blue sky. Then he walked to the top of a hill where one expected to see a glorious western landscape only to find a highway and the coup de grace, a car speeds by and a bag of McDonald's lands at his feet from people passing by. The camera pans to his face and a single tear trickles down his cheek. It's all fake. Tear was glycerin. The chief was an Italian named <laughs> Espera de Corti, born in 1904 at Kaplan, Louisiana to a family of Sicilian immigrants. Espera became an actor, and while he wasn't an Indian in real life, he played one on television in the movies over a hundred times. <laughs> Chief Iron Eyes symbolized the view that Indians were the great protectors of the environment and whites were the great destroyers. This is particularly true when it came to the buffalo. 
John Mac Farragher, in his book, Out of Many, a popular text, writes, the changes they, that is the whites, the changes they produced in some areas were nearly as cataclysmic as those that occurred during the Ice Age. I think in the Bible the phrase is selah, pause, let that sink in. The, the changes they made were as cataclysmic as those during the Ice Age. And now this shows you that historians not only can't do good history, they can't write. Here's the next sentence. Having killed off the giant herds, ranchers and farmers quickly shifted to cattle. <laughs> this particular passage lies by con combining several errors of writing history. First, it omits the fact that the buffalo were being hunted to extinction before whites came on the scene. It contains a partial truth that whites very nearly did finish the job very rapidly, but then it ignores the most important context fails to point out that it was white ranchers, conservationists, and philanthropists who saved the buffalo. Princeton historian Andrew Eisenberg, Brown anthropologist Shepard Kretsch III, and Dan Flores, a historian at the University of Montana, Missoula, all note the Indians had hunted the bison less effectively than whites, but they had hunted the bison almost to extermination. They used techniques such as surrounding the herds, driving them off the cliff, off cliffs, setting fire to the entire prairie to wipe out a herd. Some estimates made in the 1850s suggest Indians harvested almost a half million animals a year. Some think the number higher. The stench permeated the prairie for miles. Many pioneers came across the carcasses of buffalo killed by the Indians. Some tribes thought the buffalo were infinite. One tribe thought it came from a lake, but there was you know, an infinite supply of buffalo, sort of like my students' view of their parents' credit cards. Um, how many of you have heard, you've all heard this, you know, the Indians used all of the buffalo, yeah. right? It's true, but it doesn't mean what you think. They used all the buffalo, but not all at one time. If they needed bones to make a tent, they would kill the buffalo and take the bones leave the meat. If they needed the hides for coats, they'd kill the buffalo, take the hides, leave the bones, leave the meat. If they needed the meat, they'd kill the buffalo, leave the bones, leave the hides, take the meat. Okay? But they didn't always take everything. But that's kind of the view that you get of this. Noticeably, what whites did was accelerate the extinction process. Uh, there's no doubt from any quarter that it was white hunters who polished off most of the remaining buffalo herds, mainly due to their technological lead over the Indians. Armed with long range, high caliber hunting rifles, sharpshooters such as Buffalo Bill Cody could take down hundreds of animals in a single day. But then comes the part nobody tells you about. <clears throat> it was private ranchers and rich philanthropists who saved the buffalo. J.P. Morgan purchased some 20,000 acres in the West for a bison preserve and populated the land with herds. Ranchers bred beefalo, a combination of cow and buffalo, for their meat. Famous cattleman Charles Goodnight captured buffalo calves in 1878, developed his own private herd. By the early 1900s, the Goodnight herd shipped 700 privately raised and protected buffalo to Canada's Wood Buffalo National Park. That herd had grown to 14,000 by the mid 20th century. Other ranchers boasted, quote, we supply buffalo for zoos, parks, circuses, and barbecues. <laughs> This led ranchers to protect other species by breeding them and selling rights to hunt them. Uh, for an animal nearly extinct at one point, it's an amazing turnaround that by the year 2000, more buffalo were raised on private reserves strictly for their meat than even existed on all the government reserves and private zoos put together. Yet this is continually portrayed as one of the great attributes of the noble savage as opposed to civilized man. Of course, this is the same story with John D. Rockefeller and the Hoyles. When Rockefeller drastically reduced the price of kerosene, it drove whaling completely out of business. Uh, Rocky did more for the Hoyles than Greenpeace ever did, not to mention the consumer. Yet how was Rocky portrayed? Bloody, evil, an octopus. Um, 
I'm convinced, I can't prove this, but I'm convinced that when we get to the, when uh, you know, Cameron gets his little diving bell and goes down to the bottom of the Marianas Trench, he's going to find a statue of John D. Rockefeller put there by the whales, and I bet you once a year they make a pilgrimage to the bottom, and they do the whale thing, and you know, worship the statue of Rockefeller. Of course, the main focus of all the distortion in all these books is Ronald Reagan. When parents ask me how to tell if their kids' textbooks are biased, I say, go to the section on Reagan. It's the pregnancy test of bias. John Stewart thought that was pretty funny. He showed a clip of me saying that, and then he showed a picture of Reagan pregnant, which I thought was pretty funny. No matter how reasonable or fair the books are up to this point, they go over the edge when they start to deal with the Gipper. So I have four different liberal lies about Reagan in the book. I'll only go into two here. Lie number 47, the Reagan tax cuts cause massive deficits and debt. Another area where the textbooks absolutely lie about Reagan is the coverage of the economy. A typical chapter concentrates on how the tax cuts cause the massive deficits of the 1980s. None mention. None mention the fact that Reaganomics produced 14 million net new jobs. Let's see, Obamanomics has now lost 8 million. During the entire 1980s, the Euros generated zero net new jobs. I tell my students that today Germany would trade us Munich and two soccer players to be named later for 14 million net new jobs. Instead of celebrating the fantastic economic growth of the 80s, rising GNP, soaring employment, stable money, low interest rates. What do all the textbooks focus on? Deficits and the national debt in the Reagan years. In fact, the tax cuts caused more government revenue, and I say that with deference to Reagan, it's not government, it's government. More government revenue, only the Democrat Congress wouldn't quit spending. You can see between 1982 and 88, revenues went up 40%. But spending went up 100%. I brought the charts from one textbook, American Pageant, for your consideration. Here's the deficit chart. It looks like the deficits just went crazy in the Reagan years. There's a small problem. Up in the left-hand corner, you'll note it says billions of dollars. It's not real dollars. They didn't adjust for inflation. These are, you know, idiots. I mean, any economist adjusts for inflation in any calculation. So I did their calculations again with their data. But then, you know, how much you owe is related to how much you make. I'm sure, you know, some of us get a visa bill in the mail and we just about pass out. Oh my gosh, how did I spend that much money? Bill Gates gets that same bill and goes, eh, throw it on a pile, wait till it amounts to real money and then I'll pay it, right? So how much you owe depends on how much you make. So I took their numbers and adjusted them in real dollars as a percent of GNP. Not even the same chart. It's not even close. Now, maybe this is just a mistake. They're historians, after all. They're not economists. Except in the same chapter, same topic, i.e. Reagan's an idiot, we find another chart bashing Reagan on the national debt. Okay, now this one is, I love this, this is special. They know they're going after college students. So they add another little trick to this one they don't have in the last one. Um, some of you may remember the Sesame Street game. Three of these things are kind of the same thing. One of these things is not quite the same. And you got a parakeet, 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 book instructor. You say, now, Susie, what's different? Oh, ball constrictor's different. Very good, Susie. Okay, so let's, let's play the Sesame Street game with our, our titles here. Depression. Well, that's an event. World War II breaks out. Well, that's an event. Japan surrenders. Event. Korean War breaks out. Event. Vietnam War. Event. Reagan. Person. <laughs> See how clever that is? How sneaky they do that on purpose. And again, not in real dollars and not as a share of GNP. There's the real chart. It's not even close. Uh, this is a bad overlay, but 
Investors Business Daily showed this chart on the front of their 1988 issue, something about why Johnny can't learn history. Johnny can't learn history because the historians are lying to Johnny. Uh, the criticism we still hear today about any tax cut is that it benefits the wealthy. Well, no. Here's the share of taxes paid, and you'll note that after the Reagan tax cuts, the PO, the middle class, the middle class, and the upper middle class all paid between 26 and 5% less taxes after the tax cut. You'll note that the wealthier classes paid more and that the super rich paid almost 135% more after the tax cuts. I tell my students, you want the rich to pay their fair share? Cut taxes on the rich and they'll pay their fair share. Well, that don't sound right. Well, you know, in Ohio we have something called ice and snow. And when you drive on ice and you go into a skid, which way do you turn? into the skid. You're going to die. <laughs> you go, woo, woo, woo. <laughs> you turn into the skid. Well, that don't sound right. I know, but you know, if you want to live, turn into the skid. So the fact is, the poor and middle class paid less after the tax cuts. The rich paid more. This is the case with each of the four large-scale tax cuts in American history. Mellon Coolidge, 1920s, John Kennedy, 1960s, Ronald Reagan, 1980s, George Bush, 2000s. The rich end up paying more in total taxes, uh, the lower classes less. And to add a final lie, the American nation says, critics charge that Reagan's social cuts hurt the poor, elderly, and children. It doesn't mention that overall social spending rose from 1980 to 1988. Probably the worst distortions of all of Reagan's record come in the area of his greatest success, the Cold War. By the way, I can't stand to watch it. I had to watch two of these episodes to write a review of the Oliver Stone Untold History of the World. But I'm told that the latest one on the Cold War credits Gorbachev with, with you know, ending the Cold War. And, and that's from all these textbooks. They all credit Gorby for ending the Cold War. So line number nine. Mikhail Gorbachev, not Ronald Reagan, was responsible for ending the Cold War. That's right. James West Davidson's popular book, Nation of Nations, tells us that, quote, Gorbachev's reform policies not only led to the collapse of the Soviet Empire, but also the breakup of the Soviet Union itself. See, all that military spending under Reagan was unnecessary because good old Gorby was going to demilitarize the USSR all by his little old self. By the way, it's hard to see on the slide, but some of you remember this. Gorbachev had this red birthmark up here. And you know, that birthmark would take on the map shape of whatever country the Soviets were invading at the time. You always knew where they were going. Afghanistan, quick, get troops over there. They're going into Afghanistan. And I can prove it because after Gorby ceased being the dictator of the Soviet Union, his, his birthmark almost went away. And it started to come back, though, when things started happening in Georgia. I go, wait a minute, look out, Georgia. George Brown Tyndall says in his book, America, a Narrative History Court, quote, Gorbachev also backed off Soviet imperial ambitions. I guess that's why he waited five years to pull out of Afghanistan when the casualties got unsustainable. Seriously, anyone who thought Gorby was going to give up the Soviet empire is just, is just nuts. Um, finally, the ever-reliable unto a good land says, quote, Perhaps more important than Reagan, under a new, younger leadership, the Kremlin allowed long dormant forces of change to emerge and drive the USSR toward democracy and a market economy. Now, in this picture, Gorby's five years younger than me. You do not hear my students walking around UD campus talking about that young and vibrant Swikart. The only reason they talked about him as young and vibrant was because all of his predecessors were older than the Crypt Keeper. They're about 12 million years old. <laughs> this brings me to Star Wars. In 1983, well, you just look at their names, right? Chernenko, he died. This is like in a three year period. Chernenko died. The aptly named Andropov dropped off. <laughs> and then Brezhnev died, and then he came in. So, anyway. In 1983, Reagan made his famous national defense speech in which he introduced a research and engineering project called the Strategic Defense Initiative, or SDI. 
He never used the word space, satellites, or lasers, nor did he say we could shoot down missiles immediately. Rather, he asked the American scientific and engineering community to come up with a way to protect the American public against intercontinental ballistic missiles. The press made the worst mistake of their Reagan career by calling the program Star Wars. They were attempting to ridicule SDI, and Reagan did not like the term. But what the media missed was that when they were growing up, people used to make fun of technology by calling it Buck Rogers. I remember that. You know, somebody, Buck Rogers, it's way out there. Or, you know, Commander Cody. Don't you like those ray guns? You can uh, suck out your toilet and kill an alien at the same time. <laughs> by doing so, by calling it Star Wars, they turn Reagan with his youthful smile, enthusiasm, and likability into yeah. Luke Skywalker. <laughs> Suddenly it became apparent to everybody that Reagan, if Reagan's Luke, all the decrepit ancient Soviet dictators were the evil emperor. <laughs> Same guy. <laughs> I think they cast him for this, actually. And that means that Gorby was Darth. See him without his helmet? Same guy. <laughs> the fact is, Reagan's Star Wars was just one part of his massive strategy to bankrupt the Soviet Union. It scared the Russians to death because they knew we could do it. The Soviet Union spent 70% we found this out when the KGB archives were opened up. 70% of its propaganda budget to stop a system that wasn't even built that all the liberals said wouldn't work. But, be, but Gorby and Reagan knew it was possible. How did they know we could actually make it? Um, well, because in World War II, we made uh, 95,000 of these babies. We made tanks like hotcakes. We made over 300,000 airplanes. This is in just four years of war. We made a, uh, by the way, that's an Air Cobra. We made <laughs> the best Soviet fighter of 1941-42, and it was so bad we wouldn't even use it. And let, let the Russians have it. Right. We turned out a Liberty ship, most of them built here in California, by the way, in four and a half Days. I tell my students they built that ship in less time than it will take most of them to write one of their term papers. <laughs> Gorbachev knew we could do it. He knew that we had the computer technology behind Star Wars. We knew that accuracy of this type was possible. This is a cruise missile fired from 1,000 miles away and the pylon is the target. Uh, we could literally put a cruise missile in the Kremlin bathroom. What is this thing following me around, you know? <laughs> what these examples from 48 Liberal Eyes show, and this should frighten you all, is that there's no giant conspiracy to write this junk. It's much worse than that. There's an almost universal mindset that FDR saved America, that the Klan typifies American life, that no Soviet spy was ever guilty, the Reagan era was only good for deficits, and Bill Clinton never lied to anyone. <laughs> uh, never had sex with that woman, Miss Lewinsky. <laughs> I'm convinced he was talking to Monica when he said that. Uh, I, I, I never had sex with that woman, Miss Lewinsky. It's always, it's always <laughs> In 2010, I did a book called Seven Events That Made America, America, and one of the chapters was about rock music's part in bringing down the Berlin Wall. That led me to start a film company with uh, my co-producer and director, Mark Leaf, back there, called Rock and the Wall Studios. We produced our first documentary film uh, last year, and it uh, appeared on PBS, yes, PBS, this November. Uh, and it interviewed rock and rollers from both sides of the Berlin Wall as well as people uh, who lived uh, on the other side of the wall talking about their experiences with music. And there's the DVD. And there's some images of the wall in case you forgot what it looks like. What the communists found, it was impossible to keep out music. 
Pretty soon their own commie kids were playing in rock bands. <laughs> Don't you love the poster? Be stoned! Digs the primitives, yeah? <laughs> in 1984, the first Russian rock bands got to tour America in the Red Wave Tour. I bought the CD, it sucks, it's really bad. But they, you can tell that they're listening to American rock and roll. Perhaps one of the most amazing testimonies came from a Ukrainian lady who said that they closed all the churches and banned Bibles, but they let in the rock opera, Jesus Christ, a superstar. She says in the film, I come to Jesus because of Jesus Christ, a superstar. Now that's a hard combo to beat, God and rock and roll, right? So that led Mark and I to do a sequel movie, uh, Mark and me to do a sequel movie, Other Walls to Fall, uh, about music's part in penetrating and changing the Iron Veil of Islam. Uh, it, it features uh, some remarkable interviews with a heavy metal band inside Tehran. They can't play outside, they'll be beheaded or stoned, but <laughs> they managed to send us footage. Um, we have a Cambodian rapper who's on his country's death list. He can't go back like without a beard, you know fake hair and so forth. And we have some celebrities like Clint Black and Yanni and Busta Rhymes. Try putting those three names together in a sentence sometime. <laughs> uh, more recently, Mark and I have been working on turning a Patriot's History of the United States into a television miniseries. Uh, we weren't able to get the trailer up, but um, it's available if you want to see it at the Rock and the Wall Studios website, www.rockandthewallstudios.com. <laughs> Let me leave you this, and this just came to me this afternoon. Every once in a while, I do get a brilliant idea. I don't get many of them, but I, I, every once in a while, I get one or two brilliant ideas. There's a quotation from Margaret Thatcher. Watch your thoughts, for your thoughts become your words. Watch your words, because your words become your actions. Watch your actions, because your actions become your habits. Watch your habits, because your habits become your character and watch your character because your character becomes your destiny. And I was listening to a tape and this verse came out, Proverbs 18, 21. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. What we have been seeing is the left has been speaking death to America in these revisions. They are lying about our past and speaking death to our future by changing our character. They're seeking to change who we believe we are, what we believe we are, by telling us that what we were was horrible, that we are a bunch of racist, sexist, homophobic, evil people, and therefore we can't feel good about ourselves, and therefore our destiny is shot. Don't let them feed you that. Thank you. Where do you teach? I teach and, at the University of Dayton, Ohio. And how does someone get you to another university? What is it required to give a, a lecture? Um, or do you do that? They just have to invite me. Um, I, I've spoken all over, um, you know, lot, lots of colleges. I'm, in fact, Thursday morning I'll be speaking at Dixie State College in Utah. What do we do about it? You know, this is a hardest question. The hardest two questions I'm ever asked are, why are universities so tilted to the left and why is the media so tilted to the left? I can't answer that. I mean, I can give you a very long historical analysis of why it, it moved left, but I think the universities are in popular vernacular screwed. Uh, I don't think they can be saved. Uh, I think we've got to burn them down and start over. And that's why I'm so in favor of the homeschool movement. They are doing to the public schools what we're going to have to finally do to the universities. And the biggest problem with doing it to the universities is accreditation because they have the power to accredit themselves. And when you have the, the power to say, oh, we are the only ones eligible to do this, then you've got some real power. I don't know the answer to that. I wanted to ask you about the Ku Klux Klan. My understanding, um, do you cover that at all about the, the hangings, that a majority were uh, Republicans that were hung? Because they, they always talk about the African Americans that were hung, but they don't talk about the Caucasians that were hung 
fighting against what was You mean in the South, right? Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, sure I mentioned that. And, and you know, there, there's no question, a better answer to your question is, I really begin in 1820. And I start talking about how the Democrat Party, it's the facts, was created for one reason alone, and that was to protect slavery. It was created, and this is the first chapter of seven events, it was created as a party to keep slavery out of the national debate. And the way, it's, it's fascinating, the way Van Buren, Van Buren, you know, he's a brilliant guy and he gave us this system, and it turns out maybe not the best system, but it's the one we got. He creates a system that is based on spoils or patronage or jobs. And so the way you advance is you support the party and you're rewarded with party jobs or government jobs. So with every election, government began to grow. This is in the 1820s. And you know, you have people wax, wax nostalgic. Oh, wasn't it great back in the 1800s? Government wasn't so big. It wasn't so big, but it was growing. And it, it, I've only found two short periods in American history, two like three year periods and they were both depressions where government did not grow. All the rest of the time, you know, grows and grows and grows. And one of the largest reasons it grows is because to get elected, you have to give away jobs under the Jacksonian system. And, and so um, the Democrats become the party of slavery. And that's why we get the Civil War, because Lincoln is elected, and all of a sudden he has this giant government. For them, it was giant. Giant federal government who appoints federal marshals, federal judges, tax collectors, customs collectors in the South, and they're going to start enforcing, you know, they're going to get rid of all the, the uh, prohibitions against the males, bringing in abolitionist literature, that's just one thing. The marshals aren't going to arrest uh, runaway slaves, that's another thing. They revolt, because it's a party of slavery. It still is. Uh, excuse me. Um, Media is obviously something you're very good with, and you understand the, the power of media. Now, there are, there are things that Jonah Goldberg wrote about in, in Tyranny of Clichés, and there's clearly a propaganda effort to distract us from what the main issues are going on in the country today. Well, with this gun control th thing, is clearly a distraction from, because it's only 4% uh, from the economy and other things. Are there any specific main, like top three, cliches or empathy, slanders as I like to call them, that we can uh, turn the tables on as far as language goes. Because the empathy argument, he cares more about you than Romney, or Obama cares more than, yeah. that was the main aspect. Is there any like, three cliches that bother you the most? Well, of course, one of the most common is that we're a democracy. We are not a democracy, we are a democratic republic, and there is a huge difference. We do not submit to mob rule. Uh, we have uh, a constitution. Um, the, the thing about the tax cuts for the wealthy is, is the one that just sends me through the roof because we have abundant evidence. I mean, it's not even close. It's not even challengeable, and it happened under a Democrat too, John Kennedy, so th that's something that you can't really debate, and yet they always, well, it's tax cuts for the wealthy, you know? And I just tell my students, uh, how many of you ever got a job from a homeless person? <laughs> and nobody seems to raise their hand. So it's really tough, though. I I'll have to tell you, we have a, a fundraiser trying to get us some funds for Patriots history in D.C., and he says it's amazing. He says they're running around like chickens with their heads cut off. He goes, they they're just clueless, even the think tanks. Are, are questioning themselves and, and they, they just don't know what they can do and they feel so whipped and so beaten by this election. They've lost all long range strategy and, and they don't have a direction. This is why I'm so committed to making Patriots History Television. This is kind of the area where you start. You've got to start taking it back an acre at a time. Uh, Larry, have you ever considered debating? Uh, I, it'd be, I would love to see you against Dr. Zinn. Of course, it's a little late for him. But I'd kill him. <laughs> <laughs> you already have. Uh, no, seriously, have you ever thought about debating any of the writers of the textbooks? Have you ever approached them? You know, I don't like debates. I, uh, it's not because I don't. I, I was a champion debater in high school, but I don't like debates because too often, first of all, on campuses, it's rarely fair. It's usually three or four against one with a moderator who's one of them. <clears throat> so I avoid all that kind of stuff. Um, uh, I kind of invite them to, 
you know, I'll state my uh, true debate in which I state my case, and we'll let them get up and state their case, and then we'll let the, the people uh, see. You know, when Lincoln did the Lincoln-Douglas debate, and they didn't show this in the movie, which I, th I think it's a great movie, by the way. But they didn't show this in the movie, but, but Lincoln would, uh, Douglas wouldn't debate him, so he follows Douglas around and he, ha he harangues him. And of course, he's tall, taller than any American except George Washington, right? So he's back there, and uh, it, when there's a slight pause in Douglas's talk, Lincoln will go, Will the judge answer me this question? And he had this really high pitched voice, even Daniel Day Lewis doesn't quite get it. Will the judge answer me this question? And everybody turns around to see this gawky looking guy, and finally Douglas had to debate him because he was just, but they would. They would state a full, you read the debates and they, they went without, it's not a Joe Biden, right? It's not interrupt every 30 seconds. It, it was let him state his position and then he will answer the position. Or. <laughs> I'd like to bring up the United Nations because um, if lies are being told, it's being told in the name of world opinion certainly being told about Israel, and it's constant, but Israel is really a substitute for the United States in so many ways. Right. And I'd like to have you comment on that, if you would, because we used to pride ourselves on our exceptionalism, on being alone, on being unique in the world, and now we want to fit in with world opinion, and world opinion is really, in many ways, a moral monstrosity and an ethical abomination. Yeah, I, again, it's, you look at the textbooks and when it comes to Israel, it's, it's, you know, you know what they say. You don't need me to tell you what they say. It's, uh, the Palestinians are all these wonderful people who are, who are being oppressed by, by the Israelis, uh, that sort of stuff. Um, in the reader, the Patriots History reader we have back there, we had the full Agenda 21. You might want to take a look at that. That is, that is scary. But even in our own Supreme Court, we've got Justice Breyer citing international law, foreign law. Huh? How, how did we get there, you know? Uh, but yeah, it, it's very dangerous. That's where we're heading, this internationalism. Yes, yes sir. <laughs> I have a million questions for you, but uh, let me just tell you something that uh, you, most of the folks here don't know. I didn't know it until last year. But Star Wars really worked. Yeah, it did. It really worked. Yeah. And, and to prove that, <coughs> some of the people here in Los Angeles who built the darn thing suggested to Reagan to have the Soviets come over and enjoy one of their uh, soirees and talk about how we're going to do it. And Reagan said, go for it. And the Soviets came over here and listened to these engineers. And they went home saying, holy smokes, yeah. it works. It's just going to take a lot of money. Yeah. But it worked. We had the flying laser lab. I remember that. It shot down four missiles fired simultaneously, just like that. Now, the problem was it took a long time to recharge the, the battery or whatever it was. But, but they could shoot them down. And they hit an ICBM fired from Kwajalein. So absolutely, it works. Ask the Israelis, they used a version of Iron Dome to protect themselves. Uh, when you speak of homeschooling, how do you evaluate if the parents are capable of homeschooling and might they indoctrinate their children with lies so. more than <laughs> <laughs> the school? Uh, they can't indoctrinate them with anything worse than what they're getting in school today. Uh, are the parents competent? <laughs> Are parents ever competent to raise a kid? You know? Uh, what I find, and I speak at a lot of homeschool conventions, they are dedicated people. Boy, they show up there, they read the stuff, they, they go through all the, uh, the materials. Is this age appropriate? Uh, I'm, I'm struck by how, how dedicated they are and how much time they spend trying to learn to teach. I wouldn't have handled it with my son. He'd be in the grave already. I would have strangled him. <laughs> Hi. Um, I'd like to ask how you combat the growing anti-Semitism because of what's going on, because so many Jews are there causing our country to go to the left and causing our country to become more socialist. And it proves all these anti-Semites exactly their point. We've got so many people that are in the government not paying taxes, supporting Obama, 
supporting his uh, agenda. I see it, I watch Israeli news, I see the Israeli news as well, very much to the left. The Israeli universities are very much to the left. And it just proves our enemies and our haters exactly their point. It gives them ammunition to say it's the Jews' fault. Right. And you know, I, I think what I thought you were going to ask is slightly different. I thought you were getting at um, why so many Jews are liberals. And, and there's, there's a book by Pedoritz on, on this. And I don't think he does a very good job of answering this. And, and that's another one of those great mysterious questions. When I get to heaven, I'm going to, oh, come here, God. Why are Jews so liberal? You know, um, <laughs> that and why did the Cowboys not win those two Super Bowls against the Steelers? Those are going to be the really big questions of life. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's tremendous anti-Semitism out there, and, and it's being generated. Um, uh, I mean, when you start calling Israel fascist, right there, there's such a disconnect that you've got to wonder if these people have had lobotomies. But it's not, my point is that they're, they've got proof. Somebody like Geithner is sitting there, and all these, you know, yeah. Bloomberg, and they're sitting yeah. there yeah. pushing for them. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, the, the irrefutable fact is that a vastly disproportionate number of the uh, Communist Party leaders in Soviet Russia, uh, the Bolsheviks, were Jewish, Jewish intellectuals. Why? I don't know. I'm glad you brought up the, the idea of, of proverbs of life and death in the tongue. And it seems we're, we've entered such an Orwellian time that I don't know why conservatives and Republicans keep using the language of the left. Instead of calling them progressives, they're regressives. Instead of calling them liberals, they're fascists. We're the liberals. How did we lose that title? You know, um, gun control. That, it's just the ability to, to protect oneself, especially women and senior citizens. And we just keep falling and using their language, and it seems like we have to bring back life-giving right. language. I can't add to that. That's a great point. Uh, gun, I got a great story in gun control. I don't know if you remember uh, G. Gordon Liddy when he had his talk show, but he told a great story once about how uh, he was in prison, and Mrs. Liddy was at the house, and they had a break-in. And uh, Mrs. Liddy is in the middle of the night. She comes out, and, and the guy's rummaging through something or other, and she, she points her pistol at him. She says, freeze. And she says, I'm calling police right now. And he kept moving. And the kids came in behind her. She says, watch children as mommy makes the bad man's head go away. And he's, <laughs> he stopped. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, right. I mean, it, it is all about language, and we've got to regain control of the language and stop. That's why Adam's question about, you know, kind of being sensitive and how do we, you know, convince him of our empathy, screw that. We need to regain the, the, the language of reality and, and begin fighting on that, that ground. Um, I, uh, Larry, like okay. you, am uh, one of the few sensible couldn't see you behind your badge there. <laughs> One of the few sensible members of my profession, and I find myself in my industry, as you probably do, surrounded by idiots. <laughs> and I was just wondering what you, how you deal with your colleagues, and if they, uh, if they take issue with you, or if they just avoid you, or. I have it a little bit easier than you do. Um, you can get fired from your job. Uh, I have tenure. And uh, you know, unless I do strange things to small animals with a fork, they can't get rid of me. Uh, it, it's very hard for them to get rid of me. Um, so what I do is I call them. Uh, uh, you know, when I first got there, people would make little snide comments in faculty meetings and so forth and drop little one-liners, and I would just zing them back, and I would not tolerate it. And I, I think you've got to do that. You, you don't put up with that stuff, you know. You were telling me about Walton Goggins and the fist bump. I would, Absolutely not. Obama's an idiot. And walk off. You know, now, but then, you know, again, you're, you're risking your career. It's the same thing I get with students who say, hey, I've got a, a super liberal professor, uh, what do I do? And my answer is always the same. How bad do you need the course? If you need the course, you go, yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir, whatever you say, sir, Zin's great, sir, and you, you go on. If you don't need the course, you say, you're an idiot, and flunk me if you want, but you don't know what you're talking about. 
Can you talk a little bit about George W. Bush and the decision to go into Afghanistan and Iraq and how that's portrayed? Oh, sure. Um, I think any sensible person in 2002 looking at the evidence, now let me review who said there were WMDs in Iraq. Should we just play this little game here for a minute? Israel said there were WMDs in Iraq. Egypt told General Tommy Franks there were WMDs in Iraq. King Hussein of Jordan said there were WMDs in Iraq. French intelligence said there were WMDs in Iraq. The Russians sent a message to Bush saying there are not only WMDs there, they're gonna shoot them at you. NATO said there were WMDs in Iraq. Saudi Arabia said there were WMDs in Iraq. Um, Britain said there were WMDs in Iraq. And the UN arms inspectors said there are WMDs in Iraq. Now if you've got all those people saying, hey, and your own CIA director saying, yeah, there's WMDs in Iraq, you better do something about it. And I think it was perfectly appropriate. I think it was the right decision. If it was me president, I'd do it all over again. I will tell you this, and I don't think this is deliberate, but I think Bush stumbled into something. We could not in 2002 invade Yemen, Indonesia, Iraq, Iran, Saudi Arabia, uh, Morocco, every one of the countries where there were Al Qaeda cells. We couldn't do it. No, nobody can do that. But what happened was when we put troops on the ground in Iraq, guess where all the terrorists ended up? In Iraq. And I liken it to what we did in World War II with that, uh, that slide, actually. Let me get this back here because that's kind of important. Look at that bomber. Look at what's all around that bomber. German fighter planes. We lost a hell of a lot of bombers. You know that the most dangerous place you could be in 1943 was in a bomber. Not a marine on a beach, it was in a bomber. Nevertheless, we destroyed the Luftwaffe. And you know how we did it? We sucked them up to attack the bombers and then we shot them down. And, and this is a tactic that's been used throughout history. Uh, Lord Chelmsford did it to the Zulus. He marched toward their capital city. He said, I'm going to burn your city, or you can come out and fight me. They came out and fought him. He formed a big square and killed them all. You know? So I tell my students that Iraq ended up being a giant roach motel, and we killed the roaches. Um, I'd, like, I'd like you to comment on um, my theory of why um, people, Jews, are liberal and, and what the problem is. I'd like is. to hear it, yeah. And that is that we are, that these people are so comfortable and so complacent and have such a lovely view of the world that it's the difference between theory and practice. And so Jews being great thinkers were just, you know, ideologically, this is, this is a good thing, communism and sharing. I was born in Russia, I was three years old when I left, and when my first um, course at university was philosophy, and I came home and said to my mother, who was brought up in Russia, what are you, why are you so against communism? It's such a fantastic system. It's so wonderful and so real. And she looked at me and she smiled and she said, take a couple more lessons and live a couple of more years of life. And that, I believe that's really what's behind a that's, lot of this. That's very today. interesting. I had not heard that before. Um, let me give you a little bit of ammunition. Um, you know, it's always say capitalism is, is selfish and communism is selfless and all that sort of stuff. Uh, Adam Smith, in his book, Theory of Moral Sentiments, uh, which most people never read. They go straight to uh, Wealth of Nations. He established the concept of self-interest. And it's not selfishness. Self-interest is you like strawberries, but you can't stand raspberries. Uh, when you play basketball, you like to have on two pair of socks underneath your sneakers, you know? I mean, a little, a million little things like that that only you can know, and that's why people tend to overvalue their own time, talent, and energy. And, and the way you see this is look at when you go to sell a house and you see for sale by owner. <laughs> It's way overpriced, right? And, and others undervalue your time, talent, and energy because they don't have that information about you. Anyway, that's the capitalism side, but what I wanted to give you is the communism side. Communism, you can get rid of all the class struggle stuff and all the rest of it, it all boils down to one thing, labor theory of value. All socialism, all communism comes down to the labor theory of value and there's no difference between socialism and communism. They're exactly the same thing because they both accept the labor theory of value. And labor theory of value says labor makes value. There's no such thing as risk. There's no such thing as management, entrepreneurship, talent. There is only labor. Now, if it's 2 o'clock in the afternoon and you're a dozing student, 
That may sound reasonable, but when you think about it, if you get dropped in the middle of the Sahara Desert with a pick and shovel, and you go out and you start digging a hole, and at the end of eight hours, you have a beautiful hole there. I mean, it's a lovely hole. You should be able to stick your hand out if Marx is right and somebody ought to put money in your hand. Now, unless you have a minimum wage law, that's not going to happen because you have not created any value. And in fact, if through government, somebody does pay you for that valueless thing who's been benefited, you have. So communism is inherently selfish. Capitalism is inherently self less because it requires you to give something to the market. I do this every time I write a book. Well, I get advances now, but I used to not get advances. I'd have to write the whole book, hand it over to the market, and see if they pass judgment and they give me money for it, right? So, so it's selfless. It makes a, a selfless ask of the people. What do you think my time, talent, and energy is? Communism says, uh, take and it shall be given unto you. Capitalism says, given it shall be given unto you. One more? Yes. Oh, two more, okay. A couple of days ago, the latest propaganda coming out of Washington was about the unfinished civil war in trying to marginalize the conservative southern states. And I'm sure you heard the, that uh, spoken about, and I'm just wondering whether that gets any traction. And how do you see the evolution of the red states versus the blue states, and also the red states, from what I hear, have a lot of blue people moving in, yeah. bust in, uh, whatever. If you would be willing to comment on that whole, because they're, they're on salvation, basically, if states' rights and the conservative governors and so forth. Well, we could be pretty pessimistic. I mean, there's, there's grounds to be pessimistic, but there's also history, you know, and, and if you just go back, not too long ago, weren't conservatives talking about, hey, we're gonna own this country. We've got all the governors. You have a governor of California, New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, We've got the Senate, we've got the House, there's redistricting, it's only gonna get better, all these old fogey Democrats are gonna die off, it's gonna be great. And then look at how quickly things change. In America, things can, well in the world, but in America things can change rather rapidly. And yeah, I do think for a while the so-called South, it, it really blooms out into Oklahoma, Missouri, and all those areas. But it's gonna be marginalized for a while, that, that won't last forever. Because there are cycles in American history where people just kind of get fed up. Uh, I'm not totally a believer in the uh, Strauss and Howe uh, generations theory, but I think there is a lot to that, that, that the way children are, are raised, they kind of react to their parents, then they react. They, Strauss and Howe lay out a four-part generational cycle, and it does seem to pretty well hold up. We have universities that have done down three decades of, of so-called children people who can't think. So my, my students can think very well. They just don't think about the things we like to think about. <laughs> but they are, don't kid yourself. It's like drug dealers are, are great leaders. They just lead the wrong thing. But don't kid yourself. There are some great leaders out there because they can mass entire gangs behind them. Yes, ma'am. You may have just answered the question, but I'm gonna ask it again anyway. You said that we're gonna take back America an acre at a time. But I feel like we're in a bit of a free fall economically in foreign, in the, in, in foreign policy right now with the Arab um, chaos. And, um, and so I, I sense that something more drastic has to be done. We are so far detached from our constitutional foundation. Can you speak about something that might be a little more dramatic than one acre at a time? Well, um, you know, my co-author on Modern World, we have this debate all the time. He's very pessimistic. He thinks we got maybe two, three years. He thinks we're going to have a, a civil war. The, the for, it's going to start with the de when, when the dollar no longer is, is named the reserve currency of the world. That's it. Everything loses its value by you know 50, 60 percent. You know, there's chaos. The social security checks don't go out. The old people, like in South Park, come out and start beating on you with their canes, and uh, it's it's just a, a disaster and he sees the whole country going into civil war. Um, I tend to look at things in history. I, I look at, for example, World War II. If you looked in World War II in uh, May 1942, you would think that we were in a free fall. 
you would think we're going to lose this thing. The Japanese haven't been beaten one time anywhere. They controlled a larger area with more people than any empire in human history at the cost of one destroyer. It was astounding. The Germans were beating on the door of Moscow, and the, and the Russians were only holding out because we sent them tanks and planes. you know. And yet, one month later, everything was different. The Russians counterattacked. We had the Battle of Midway. And before you know it, neither the Germans nor the Japanese could win the war. And it's like that many times. I mean, how close were we in the Civil War? We were one cavalry commander away from losing the first day at Gettysburg. If General John Buford comes out and he doesn't look at those heights and go, oh, we're going to get killed if we don't hold this ground because the Confederates are going to take the high ground, the battle's already over. And he held the high ground. And little things like that turn history. And so I'm a believer in little things in history and that you can't always predict free falls or great ascents, as, as you were saying. Thank you all very much for your questions. Thank and you, Professor. I'll be Michael. signing books back there. Thanks.